Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, thank you for being with us uh, uh, for this dialogue. Actually, we are uh, with Professor Carrie uh, Brown uh, from King's College London, uh, presented uh, with the uh, Center for China and Globalization. Uh, we're live in Beijing and uh, at the CCG New Multimedia Center. Uh, actually, the topic of our dialogue today is uh, moving forward to a new future. China and the world in the upcoming uh, post-pandemic world. And with also the uh, upcoming two sections, and also we're going to uh, discuss many, many issues. So uh, very glad to uh, welcome uh, uh, Professor uh, Carrie Brown. Uh, perhaps, uh, Carrie Brown, you want to say hi to our audience, uh, which is live on uh, online? Yeah, I'm very grateful to be here today. I'm in the UK at the moment. It's great to be able to work with CCG and with my good friend, Henry Wang. And uh, I I'm really glad to be able to talk to people and understand your perspectives too. Good morning. Good afternoon. Great. Good afternoon also for uh, our, our uh, audience in the, in the world and, uh, and also in the UK uh, uh, as well. So this dialogue series is part of uh, CCG China and the World webinar series that we launched in March uh, 2020 uh, in an effort to engage eminent scholars, uh, think tankers, and uh, also government advisors, advocate uh, stakeholders, business uh, folks uh, in China and from around the world, basically to continue to exchange virtually uh, while the travel across the boundaries are, are not uh, possible uh, disrupted by the COVID-19. And uh, uh, so far, actually, CCG has conducted over 60 episodes of uh, uh, webinars and uh, uh, conference talks uh, with uh, uh, topics on uh, uh, China-U.S. relations with Europe, uh, global pandemic fighting, uh, cooperation, multilateral trade, technology innovation, and China domestic and uh, uh, economic reform, and, of course, 14th Five Years Plan, uh, with millions of uh, viewers uh, uh, in China and uh, uh, in the world as well. So today we are very pleased to have uh, 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 Professor Carrie Brown with us. Uh, 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 professor Carrie Brown actually uh, is a professor of Chinese studies and the director of the Lao China Institute at King's College London. Uh, he's very well uh, uh, known from 2012 to 2015. He was a professor uh, at the, the uh, University uh, 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 Professor uh, of the uh, Chinese Politics and the Director of China Study Centers at the University of Sydney, Australia. Uh, prior to this, he worked at the Chatham House uh, for over uh, six years, actually, uh, as a senior fellow and also the head of Asian program. Uh, meanwhile, from 2011 to 2014, he directed the Europe-China Research and Advice Network. Uh, giving policy advice and uh, uh, to the uh, European External uh, Action Service. So he's quite knowledgeable uh, uh, on China and uh, on the uh, uh, China international relations and also uh, in the world at large. Uh, as a matter of fact, also uh, Carrie is very uh, versed in uh, both Chinese and English. He has an AMA from Cambridge University and a postgraduate uh, diploma in Mandarin in Chinese uh, from uh, Times Valley University, London, and also a PhD uh, in Chinese politics and language from Leeds University. I know, uh, Carrie, you are also uh, the author of, uh, of uh, 10 books on modern Chinese uh, uh, politics and uh, history and language, uh, including uh, What's Wrong with Diplomacy, the Case of UK and China, uh, also a Berkshire Dictionary on China Biography, uh, and also Chinese, China CEO Xi Jinping, and uh, uh, China's world, uh, what does China want, uh, uh, just to name a few. Uh, so, so Kerry, I, I came to know you, uh, of course, uh, I, I remember a number of years ago, uh, we were at a conference at uh, Zurich in Switzerland. I mean, uh, that was a really, uh, you know, I, I heard you first time, we were very impressive. But also, uh, we were uh, happy that uh, in 2018, uh, uh, we actually uh, invited you to come to CCG, have a round table with, uh, with the Chatham House delegation. Also, we were, uh, had the meetings at the Schwarzman College. So you are very well, uh, actually, you are not strangers to CCG. <laughs> and uh, I, I'm very also impressed with the, uh, the uh, webinar you organized uh, uh, just some time ago on, on dialogues on dialogue. 
and uh, which I think is really a, a, a very fascinating and uh, deep thinking uh, uh, process that you have actually initiated. So the, uh, the, the question we actually we want to uh, uh, cover today is that we are at actually a very uh, 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 turning point or crossroad, uh, uh, you, you may say so, that, uh, uh, for example, China, uh, in the last uh, 10 days, uh, we, we had uh, uh, President Xi has announced that China has actually reached the target of elevating uh, e extreme poverty, uh, which basically lifted uh, almost 800 million people out of poverty. And also China going to have a two section, which is a National People's Congress and also uh, CPC, uh, CP, CCPCC, which is also Chinese Political Consultative Conference, are uh, going to be held, two sections going to be held uh, uh, in the next two days, and which China going to launch its 14th or five years plan. But of course, uh, internationally, we see a lot of changes uh, as well. Uh, we have a new president, Biden, that comes up, uh, pursue a, 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 a somewhat or quite different policy uh, than President Trump, for example, on the multilateralism uh, that uh, President Biden is, is very uh, positive on the climate change and uh, uh, also on the, on the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, other other issues, pandemic fighting, for example, WHO support and things like that. But of course, we, we see him uh, sp spoke at uh, a Munich Security Conference just uh, a week or 10 days ago that uh, he actually uh, talked about uh, also, uh, uh, of course, China is a, is a competitor, but also there, there are areas that can be collaborative with China as well. So we're at, we're at this actually a jump uh, point where we're starting a, a new Chinese year. Uh, so, so we would like to really, uh, 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 you know, uh, ask you and discuss with you on some of the new thought and some of the new thinking that you've been really uh, uh, contemplating for, for, for a number of years. I'm, I'm, I'm quite impressed with uh, uh, your, 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 your dialogue on dialogue, for example, that uh, really uh, 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 hit a lot of uh, uh, hard issues. Uh, uh, for example, China is really a hybrid, you know, from, from what I can know, China economy is really doing well. Uh, we had an event with World Bank just about uh, a month or two ago that on, the, on the World Bank, uh, the uh, uh, global economic outlook, where World Bank a vice president uh, told me that uh, China was the only major economy managed to have a two, over 2% 2 growth last year. And it's all, so, so you can see that uh, uh, internationally, we, we, everybody is, is uh, talking about China, but China's uh, image and, of course, China's, uh, 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 what China has done has not been probably well uh, understood outside China, or there's even some misunderstanding about China. So you're, you're, you're actually a, a very uh, 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 deep thinker and scholar that you have published, uh, 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 you know, almost uh, 10, 20 books on, on Chinese uh, uh, modern history, politics and Chinese uh, world views. I know that uh, your, your, re your recent book, your more recent bo book, seems to switch lens now from, uh, uh, by looking at the world's view on China and concentrating on the standings between the West and China. But your first coming book uh, is about how European perceived China in the past 800 years so probably you can uh, tell us about your, your new book that is coming up. Uh, Great, you? thank you very much. Well, look, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Henry. And um, yeah, I, I mean, it's an interesting time because normally any year I would go to China several times. Um, like you said, in 2019, uh, I was at the Schwarzman College in October and November and then came to see you and saw other partners and I'd go to Shanghai and other places. And so uh, for the last year, there's been none of that kind of physical kind of traveling to and from China. So uh, it means that we have to make an extra effort to maintain dialogue, particularly because politics never stops changing. Uh, you know, politics doesn't have to get on a plane and fly anywhere. Politics just happens wherever people are. And um, of course, the political uh, context between China and the world has become much more complicated. Um, and so because of that, I started to think about, you know, uh, what, what was always the case? Has it always been that Europe and China have 
um, you know, kind of had sort of a very, um, I wouldn't say an unbalanced relationship, but, but a difficult one. And so I went back further. I kept on seeing quotes to works by great European thinkers like Leibniz, uh, like Montesquieu, like uh, Voltaire, uh, of course, Marx, um, Hegel, uh, Max Weber in this century, uh, Bertrand Russell, who actually went to China, I think, and was lecturing at Peking University in the early 1920s. And even further back to the time of the Jesuits, Matteo Ricci and people like this. And uh, I kind of wondered whether there was this similar kind of, you know, sort of almost uh, un, uh, like, a, like a kind of a dual view of China, um, sometimes really admiring China, sometimes really uh, criticizing China. And, you know, kind of how did uh, Europeans figure it? That's really the foundation of this book. So I pulled together the main works referring to China by the figures I just mentioned. And I suppose what I was struck by is during the Enlightenment uh, in the 18th, 19th centuries, particularly the 18th century, um, you know, these great figures, Leibniz, who, of course, is one of the most important philosophers Europe produced, a real polyglot, a man of incredible uh, abilities across a whole range of disciplines, Montesquieu, whose work, The Spirit of the Laws, was so influential in the foundation of American democracy and the American Constitution. And Voltaire, who, of course, is the, you know, kind of ultimate skeptical liberal thinker who uh, who still is quoted today and, and read today. These figures did write about China and they wrote about China in, in some detail. And although they hadn't been to China, of course, I mean, it wouldn't have been possible then to get to China very easily. They did have a very distinctive view. Voltaire was very admiring and really compared the, uh, I suppose it would be the Qing court then, the Qing uh, emperor to, um, you know, the kind of systems that existed in Europe and felt that uh, the secular kind of world of uh, China without a state religion was preferable. Uh, Leibniz was very much led by looking at the evidence that came from the, wor the world of China uh, via the Jesuits. He was very close to many of the Jesuit scholars and read their works a lot. And so he was really interested in what he called the sort of Confucian system of governance. And so really tried to look at what China presented to him. He wrote a line about how his position wasn't to make some value judgments, but just to try and understand and put that first of all. And then Montesquieu, who really regarded China as a sort of despotic, autocratic, you know, kind of highly imperial system that was not at all attractive. So you've got, in a sense, the three positions, I suppose, that we still see today. I mean, it's extraordinary. We've come on 300, 350 years, but these very entrenched positions are still there. Uh, the position of the admirer, um, the empiricist, I suppose, Leibniz, and then the... Um, I wouldn't call it sceptical, but the dissenter. Um, and I think European debate today, not talking about American debate, so we can refer to that, but European debate is divided between those, I think, who have a very critical view of China and regard, regard China as a, as a threat, those who are very admiring of China and of what it's done with its economy and its political system and are you know, kind of not really that critical. And then the ones in the middle, uh, and that middle space is declining, it's shrinking, who feel that we have to understand before we really make some big judgments and that we have a lot to understand before we can get there. And I suppose that's really what universities are trying to do, though the, politi the politicization of universities has certainly um, increased and made it more difficult uh, I mean, I guess finally I would say today, and that's the why, reason why I did this book, because I wanted to know the historic roots of this. But today, um, I think it's more difficult than ever to have a reasoned debate about China or with Chinese colleagues that is not misinterpreted, uh, that is not kind of framed as something that has some big political meaning, either pro or anti-China. I mean, if I study science, I mean, does it make any sense to say that I'm pro or anti-science? I mean, I'm studying science, right? I mean, 
my job as a sinologist, I guess, is to study China. There's many aspects of China, its culture, its history, its politics, its geography. I don't know what it means to say that I'm pro or anti-China. I'm just interested in the facts that I see about China. And I think that that spirit is something we have to get back. Yeah, thank you, Carrie. Uh, 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 Actually, uh, a fascinating uh, book. I, I, I see that you are, you are, uh, you are writing and, and uh, uh, compiling. Actually, all those uh, historical figures, uh, uh, their interpretation of China, and uh, but also their, <clears throat> as you said, there's a, a probably different views. But it's good to, to go back to 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 the to those uh, uh, historical views on China, and we can see how how far that has been evolved and changed and this is really going to be very stimulating and very uh, 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 you know forthcoming for uh, both people in China I think uh, 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 around the world uh, to, to look at China uh, uh, on some uh, historical perspective but also uh, realistically uh, 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 on the modern China uh, as we all know that China uh, as you said it's, it's a hybrid uh, you know I, I, I totally agree with that because for example in the Chinese economy, which doing extremely well uh, is that largely the the, the practice the uh, private sector is about 60 70 percent of that in private sector and then they have uh, 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 SOE you know about another 10, 10 15 20 percent and another 10 20 percent of multinational uh, foreign investment in China so that actually uh, seems to work well in China uh, uh, as I as I read your paper you also said that you know of course China is uh, has a quite a lot of element, you know, they have a Marx, they have a, a, a capitalist, a socialist, and, and Confucius, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a hybrid. And so, uh, but also China doesn't have a strong religion in the past. So, so you can see that uh, China always have a centralized uh, historically due to the uh, uh, big uh, floods and uh, irrigation or, or vast territory or, or invaders from North. Now they have to be really uh, very centralized uh, to, to combat uh, all the challenges. Uh, which is a, a, a culture and a history uh, over 5,000 years, and I interrupted and and uh, still maintain the, uh, the, uh, the 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 genes of, of of China. So 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 I think that uh, it's really fascinating uh, uh, that that you are actually going to dip on that and look at the, how how that going to change uh, uh, how we can really make uh, uh, more studies. I mean, uh, let's not take a stand, but let's maybe more uh, take a, a study on that. So what I, what I would like to pursue on that is that you see uh, China's, uh, 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 you know, there's a, there's a gap on, on the world view uh, between uh, uh, world and, and also China, even between uh, different countries. So uh, uh, so what do you think has contributed to this uh, uh, cognitive gap? <clears throat> Maybe how that view differently? What, what has, uh, has been, uh, what can be improved or, or, or what can be done? I mean, uh, both uh, internally and externally for uh, for China and other countries, uh, based on your observation, maybe uh, this is a, a question that I, I, I come to mind. Yeah, I mean, I suppose the three big things that are uh, difficult for those outside of China, particularly if we talk about Europe and America, still as the most significant economic blocks in the world next to China. Uh, so Europe, America, and China constitute over half of global GDP. So if you put those three together, um, you can understand that for Europeans and Americans, I think that there are three things that are kind of very new and very difficult to, to really kind of understand. The first is, um, you know, in modern history, I don't think there's ever been uh, an appreciation of China as a sort of strong and powerful country. I mean, historically, since the 19th century and the era of colonization and you know the beginning of the century of humiliation for China uh the the kind of way in which I think western mindsets have looked towards China is a place which is marginal um as the work of Rana Mitter has shown China's alliance in the second world war was never really appreciated uh you know it was really just a sort of a side attendee at the important conferences after the war uh, even though it had been one of the main battlefronts for the American and British, you know, kind of alliance um, against fascism. And so, you know, this kind of marginality, I think, is is in uh, European and Americans' mindsets. 
And of course, now they're looking at a China which is economically and militarily and politically much, much stronger. It's not marginal at all. And it's being restored to a place of historic importance. And I think that this is proving very difficult. I think the attitude towards China that has been dominant for most of the post-war period is a place which is separate and not really part of the developed world. And now, of course, China is entering that world with a fifth of global GDP and a significant middle class. So this is a big, big change. And I think people's mindsets are really not um, used to sort of thinking of China as a major equal power. So that's the first problem for them. I think the second is that we've never really thought of China as a uh, kind of global power. We thought of it as maybe a land power and historically understood that the consolidation of China's land borders historically and after the People's Republic of China was established in 1949. This meant that China could be described as a land power. We've never thought of China as a naval power. And now, of course, we see that China has naval assets. I think it's got more vessels than the United States, though technologically, of course, there are big differences. So China as a power that actually gets way beyond its borders and has a naval capacity and also a cyber capacity, this is something new too. I don't think really we have got used to this idea. Uh, and it's really only since 1980s, I think it was uh, Liu Huaqing, the general then who really started that process. Um, and then the third thing, which I think is a uh, the most difficult, is that we, uh, the Western world, uh, ha has no idea what it means to run a world or part of the world on Chinese values. And the values clash is the most difficult because there are two problems. One is the uh, kind of certainty that we think we know about our own values as Europeans or Americans. But I think in the last few years, there's been confusion. What are our values? Our political values seem divided. When we talk about key terms like democracy, we often get divided. Does, you know, kind of uh, the, the presidency of Trump, does that represent true democracy or is it uh, actually the opposite of that? Uh, I mean, of course, there's no kind of denial that people are very committed to the their beliefs but their beliefs are often significantly different. Um, and I think the second problem is that there is a lack of understanding of what to make of Chinese values. And either there's a desire to say that these values are not important or to not want to know about them. I mean, I think that the West has often invested a lot into not wanting to understand China. I mean, you commit to a kind of view, almost like confirmation bias. You know, you feel like you understand something and no matter what evidence comes to you, you don't want to change your mind. I mean, we all do this about certain things. And I think for China, uh, Chinese values, there's this assumption that there's this kind of set of values, that they're very problematic, that they're a conflict with the West, that they're a threat to the West. And I have argued um as, a, as have a lot of other people, uh, including Elizabeth Perry and, you know, very kind of distinguished scholars have argued that Chinese values are hybrid. I mean, it's a kind of culture and a history which has had different kinds of uh, ethical and philosophical and religious views from Confucianism to Taoism and then contemporary belief systems. Uh, this is a very flexible worldview. And it's something that I think it's hard to kind of immediately describe. And I think that's really one of the problems that uh, in the current political environment in Europe and America, there's a desire to have a simple, you know, a simple term, a simple label that you can then embrace or attack. And I think China isn't some place that you can give a simple label to. I mean, there are some aspects of China, which, of course, like poverty relief, China's work in climate change uh, have been essential and important parts of a very good dialogue with the rest of the world. There are other issues which, of course, have been much more problematic. So 
it's not that there's a complete agreement or a disagreement. There's a very, very broad range of complex issues that we have to take a different position on. And I think that this is a difficult thing for many people who have never really thought about China a lot, have never really under, sort of uh, what, what needed to understand China. Now they have to acquire this knowledge. And I think for many of them, uh, maybe there's not a desire to acquire the knowledge. They just want to have the opinion. Well, then, of course, their opinion is what guides them. Um, and I suppose finally, you know, my job and the job of my colleagues is is to sort of just try and uh, kind of convey that China has this very complex worldview, these different belief systems, maybe, or different attitudes. And that we have to basically understand them before we can then see what the problem is. Um, because some of those attitudes and beliefs, I think, are probably pretty unproblematic. And some of them may be more difficult and take a lot of dialogue. But we're not going to get very far if we don't have that dialogue. And I think that's really what is lacking at the moment, a proper dialogue on uh, what we do agree with and what we don't agree with. And what then, most importantly, do we do about that disagreement? Yeah, thank you, <clears throat> Kerry. I think that you, you really uh, uh, raised a, a very profound question, is that uh, how we can read about China, how we can understand about China, uh, particularly in the, in the uh, 21st century and particularly in the post-pandemic uh, future, uh, that uh, you talk about uh, three points, I think those are very valid and, and actually uh, could make us all uh, think deeply, uh, you know, uh, on, on the equal power, you know, whether, you know, because of the history in the past, China in the last 200 years was very weak. And of course, now it, it quickly surged as, as a global power, uh, you know, land and, and marine power uh, also. But also, you, you rightly uh, hinted on, on, the, on the most important thing is about the Chinese value. And then probably uh, what uh, uh, some Western friends were saying, okay, uh, let's have a converge. Uh, rather than you know uh, accepting a, a different China, but I, I, I as you know, you, you are a sinologist, as uh, Deng Xiaoping famous said, if it doesn't matter, it's a white cat, black cat, as long as it catches mice. Uh, so that uh, we actually uh, China, you know, in the uh, you know uh, the shoe that feeds Chinese feet. I mean, now they've been wearing. I, I, I totally agree. You know that it's a hybrid. We have uh, market uh, forces. We have a, a, a capitalist, uh, you know, some of the methodology, but also we have a socialist uh, 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 in general that uh, with Chinese characteristics. Uh, for example, uh, President Xi, uh, uh, you know, recently um, also at, at the at elevating uh, conference in Great Hall, the people that we have, China has lifted so much uh, out of poverty. And China actually now has about uh, 1.3 billion people have some kind of a med medical uh, care coverage, and also over 1 billion people have uh, uh, some kind of social security, which is the largest welfare system probably uh, in, in the world now. So, so China has done right with uh, uh, the second largest GDP, and also people uh, estimating that uh, the pandemic fighting that China maintained the positive growth will accelerate China's uh, uh, probably uh, economic growth in, in a, a number of years to come. So, so what, what I think now is that uh, uh, we have a really, as a scholar, uh, both in China, uh, particularly outside China uh, as well, uh, uh, in many other countries, that we probably need to interpret what, what this phenomenon means to the future of the world. And, uh, and you have done some excellent works on that. So, so really, I'm really uh, appalled of what <laughs> you've been doing. But, but also put, put forward deep thinking questions that uh, it's not black and white, I mean, in terms of uh, a clear cut, uh, uh, it's really uh, complex, but then uh, can we really, uh, you know, based on what China has been doing, based on China's uh, contributing to the over one third of the global GDP growth, based on China becoming the largest trading nation with 130 countries, uh, based on China become a global value chain uh, center, can we really uh, peacefully uh, coexistence because uh, otherwise we're going to uh, face uh, uh, a devastating uh, uh, you know conflict as uh, as my friend Graham Allison <laughs> said many times this hideous trap uh, that uh, that we, we may end up with so so I'm really uh, 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 really uh, uh, encouraged by 
uh, your spirit of, uh, of uh, deep thinking and also digging to this question. So you actually, in one of your journal uh, articles, uh, uh, and uh, uh, also in, in, in some, uh, you, you actually, China in the Western foreign policy discourse is more often uh, than not described as a problem or a challenge. And, uh, but you, in fact, you once said China's challenge is, is ontological complexity. <laughs> so what, what, what do you mean by that? Well, I, I mean, that's a rather grand term. I, I like to use these grand terms sometimes, sure. but, 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 but I, I think what is um, common in, in thinking and talking about China is this, this complexity. And I think that is one of the problems that, uh, you know, when you're with an alliance, um, there's, there's a sort of similarity that you can go from that, maybe a common language or common religion, uh, or, you know, kind of some common belief systems that then get you to, you know, kind of more complicated areas, but, but you have at least something to step on. And obviously, uh, for much of their histories, Europe and China, or, you know, the previous dynasties from the Han onwards to the Tang and the Sung and the, the kind of Yuan and Ming and Qing, you know, they had very limited uh, relationships with, with, with Europe, you know, and Europe itself was not unified, of course, and isn't unified. So, so you've got a, a kind of quite a complicated situation. Um, and I, I mean, in, in a sense, I think for politicians, of course, the pressures on them are very great and they've got to really come up with things which seem to be straightforward and simple. I mean, they've got to kind of, you know, with all these different messages, they've got to convey something. I mean, Trump and his make America great again, you know, four words, basically four words. Um, and, and, you know, uh, this sort of gets lots of people very excited, um, even though, of course, you can argue and, and people do argue a lot about what that actually means um, and whether it's possible. And it's very hard to capture the China story in just a few words. Uh, and when I'm asked, you know, in, in, in kind of events outside of China, well, how do I explain China and its you know, rise in the world. Um, it's kind of something that will take quite a lot of explanation uh, because it's not a capitalist country, but it uses elements of capitalism. It's a communist country, but with a very specific form of communism, uh, you know, the development of the Communist Party in China really from the 1930s onwards was very distinctive under Mao Zedong. So, so you know, kind of there's all sorts of reasons why this is not an easy thing to convey in just a few words. You need an audience that, that have quite a lot of knowledge. And of course, many audiences don't have that knowledge because, well, they're not, you know, they haven't had to have it until now. I mean, they may know some things about America and they may know some things about Europe, but they've never really had to think about China that much because it's always been remote from them. Um, in the UK, I think this is particularly true, apart from Hong Kong, the UK's historic links with China in, in the last century were, you know, kind of very indirect. Um, you know, there's one specific thing and then not really a great deal of interaction and not really a great deal of, of knowledge. And in the kind of 1960s, when the Society of Anglo-Chinese Understanding was set up with Joseph Needham, uh, Li, I think it's Li Hai Se, you know, the great kind of uh, uh, scientific uh, kind of scholar who wrote Science and Civilization in China. I, I, I knew him very briefly at the end of the 1980s when I was a student at Keyes College in Cambridge, where he was one of the fellows. Um, you know, this, these sort of figures were uh, uh, exceptional. They weren't uh, a part of the mainstream at all. And, uh, you know, in, in many ways, people could do most of the things they wanted without any real knowledge of China at all. When I was growing up, um, China was not part of my world. I remember uh, in September 1976, the day when I saw the, the sort of this elderly Chinese man's face on TV. And they, the, the announcement was that, you know, that the leader of China, Mao Zedong, had died. That was the first time I'd seen news about um, 
you know, China on TV. And um, so I think it's been a big and dramatic change that now we have something like 100, I think 150,000 Chinese students in universities in Britain. And, you know, China is much more present and it's the world, you know, it's the largest trading partner in Australia. It's uh, obviously, you know, huge economic player. These are all very new things and they're kind of happening very, very quickly. And I think um, it was always going to be difficult to have a new player come along who appeared so quickly. That was always going to be difficult. On top of which, politically and culturally, this new player is very different to ones that have been dominant in the last 100, 150 years. I mean, you, you know, this is the sort of most problematic thing that there are three big differences. Um, the new emergence of China as an important player, that's a big difference, wasn't like that before. The second is China's political difference to the you know, Americans and Europeans. And the third is a cultural difference. So we need to have three kinds of knowledge. Well, this is very, very difficult. Um, I think if you look at the situation in Australia, so many people say that Australia has a, um, you know, it's worked out a strategy towards China, but I think it's, it's not true. I mean, Australia has had extremely important economic links with China. There are 1.5 million Australians of Chinese heritage. And until recently, Australian universities had many, many Chinese students. And over the last uh, 18 months, the relationship between Australia and China has obviously really deteriorated. And I mean, I'm not going to kind of talk about whose fault that is, but I do think that in Australia, there is obviously some issues about the way in which Australia uh, has sort of um, a uh, kind of very sensitive worry about its own identity. I mean, is it an Asian country? I mean, or is it just a European colony in, in, in you know, Asia? I mean, that was historically the, the sort of idea um, and the identity. And I think, you know, those are really domestic issues. They're not about China so much. They're about, you know, the identity of Australians and who they think they are and where they think they belong. And they're always there. I mean, they were always there when Japan was a dominant economy in the 1980s. When I lived in Australia in the early 1990s, it was Japan that was regarded as, you know, the problem. Then Indonesia, because of being so close to uh, Australia. And so it seems to me that China has become the third of these sort of worrying neighbours that Australia, um, you know, kind of thinks is, is a threat, not just because of its uh, economic and political issues, but because of identity issues. And I think that's where um, the dialogue about China becomes most difficult because, of course, in terms of economic structure, in terms of politics, I think, yes, we can, we can certainly identify areas where um, we should be concerned, we should have, uh, you know, kind of very tough dialogue with, with partners in China. Yeah, for sure. Um, trade negotiations were never easy, but we need to have them. And I think we know where we're trying to, kind of get to but I think what's worried me in the last year and I, I think it's the thing that most disturbs me is that uh, underneath a lot of these valid concerns which we should talk about and will talk about there is something um, which is much more about identity and this idea of China being a threat because it's not like us and when you ask what does it mean to be not like us it kind of creeps into areas about, well, China is, you know, ethnically different and uh, culturally different. Um, and, you know, it's just not kind of possible for the world to have a non-European or a non-American country that is going to be very dominant and very prominent. And the reason for that is not clearly economic and not clearly political. It's about something else. Now, I think the vast majority of people are not thinking this way. But I do think that it kind of is an area that we have to be very concerned about. Uh, you know, it, it's always been a problem in thinking about China and Asia generally in Australia and Britain and America, that uh, there's the valid concerns, but they get mixed up with these more racial issues. And I think these more racial issues have become uh, more vociferous, um, in, particularly in the Trump presidency. 
uh, and there are expressions of opinions uh, which I find sometimes to be purely based on this idea of race, which I find, you know, repugnant. I think it's something that we have to condemn, uh, but it's something that still, ha you know, is having space. And that's a very, very huge worry. Yeah, thank you, uh, Carrie. I, I think you, you really uh, outlined, I think, very uh, profound uh, uh, challenge, actually, uh, that China is facing, uh, you know, peaceful rise, but then uh, uh, the world really, particularly the Western world has, uh, has an understanding on China. As you said, you know, it's, a, it's a different culture, uh, different history, and probably a different system. Uh, so so how, how, how that can reconcile with, uh, with, the, with the rest of the, the values or traditionally views on China? That, that really, uh, things are changing too fast and China probably is doing too well uh, in terms of economic. Economically, you know, uh, China is the largest trading uh, partner for 130 countries, and so many countries uh, really depend on China, uh, like neighboring countries like ASEAN become the largest trading partner, and, and, and China also become a largest trading nation to EU uh, as well. And, uh, but, but I think, you know, uh, that's something you, 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 you raised very well. I think that, that it's really for the scholars and think tank community, policymakers, to really think deeply, how, how can we have a new narrative, really to interpret China or explain China. I think there's, there's first for China, you know, we have a lot of work to do to have a new narrative, upgrade on your narrative or maybe, but also for, for the Western world, we need more exchanges, as you said, particularly dialogue. I mean, we just had the uh, Australia uh, <laughs> embassy uh, minister, uh, mm -hmm. council of, of minister visit us just uh, two days ago. Uh, we have a lot of dialogue. I think that, is, that, that really helped. And also that uh, 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 now China, you know, is developing so fast, but maybe we should not use the traditional lens to look at China. For example, China right now has a 1 billion smartphone users. You can probably think China has a, a digital, some kind of democracy online, uh, where to go, what to buy, people making, auto, you know, uh, uh, self-making decisions every day. And then collectively uh, they, share, they form the market democracy. And on top of that, China now with all the modern uh, communication uh, uh, technology and uh, it's not an old days that uh, emperor is uh, uh, far away, the mountain is high and everybody's autocratic and then uh, make, make, uh, make all those autocratic decisions. Now, it, you know, the, uh, everybody uh, and also the leadership is well informed. And, and actually also China has its own consultative democracy. Uh, like, uh, uh, for Mr. Wang, you mentioned that China have, have this uh, consolidated democracy, like the, on the 14th, five years plan. China has many layers of discussions and the round tables, and then they actually seek the one million suggestions and the comments and the revisions. So, so you can see it, it does have, uh, which is the upcoming two section. Uh, also, it's an annual uh, debate on Chinese policy. So, so there is quite a lot of. Uh, uh, consolidated democracy as well. And uh, whereas I think digital democracy, technology, and with the movement of the people, China has, uh, you know, 700,000 uh, students study abroad every year, which we uh, track that annually on our blue book on Chinese students study abroad uh, with, with CAS uh, publishing. But also China has over 100 million people uh, before the pandemic traveling around the world. So, so I think the world probably, as, as, as you mentioned that, it's really a, a, such a, a, a tough challenge to, to really, uh, really match the, 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 uh, the, 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 some kind of value, because if we can uh, contribute to the, to the human being growth, if we can contribute to the prosperity and uh, uh, development of the mankind, you know, why not we, 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 we a bit more tolerant to different, you know, system, or it, like Fukuyama-san said, it's not end of the history now. So, so what, 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 what we really, uh, scholars uh, in China and around the world, how we can have a, a, a more uh, a discussion dialogue on that, I think is absolutely uh, crucial, as you just said. Uh, I, I noticed that from 1998 to 2005, uh, you worked at actually a British Foreign and Commonwealth Office, which is, uh, you were a diplomat. You were as a first secretary uh, at the British Embassy in Beijing, which is, uh, you have a lot of experience uh, on the foreign affairs, but also then ahead of uh, Indonesia, Philippines, and East Timor section. 
also from uh, 1994 to 1996, you lived in the Inner Mongolia region in China. So, so you are truly a, a China hand. So how, you know, being a diplomat, a, 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 a scholar, a think tanker, uh, how did you, uh, and also historical view, I mean, you're now uh, doing your new book now. Uh, 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 how did you reconcile that, you uh, know, the, the challenge you have now? I mean, uh, you, you've been uh, uh, someone really know China. So, so what do you see, see the gap uh, between this Western uh, 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 understood by, particularly in the foreign policy area, uh, that China and and uh, and academics in the West, uh, there's always uh, you know uh, uh, there's a lot of lot of understanding and how we can uh, all together maybe overcome that differences. Yeah, I guess that there are sort of two ways of acquiring knowledge. One is deliberately, and the other is by accident. And uh, I mean, a lot of my knowledge about China, um, if, if I've got knowledge about China, it's been acquired probably more by accident than design. I mean, I, I didn't do Chinese as a, a student at Cambridge. I did English literature. And so I, afterwards, then I developed an interest in China. Actually, while living in Japan in 1991, um, 1990, 1991, I visited China. Uh, I went to Beijing for a week. And um, then I really felt, wow, I want to know more about this place. And after that, really concentrated on uh, understanding Chinese language and um, history, more modern history than imperial history. But since then, I have, of course, read as much as I could about uh, the kind of long, long kind of um, narrative of Chinese histories. I guess um, I was, I, I mean, it's a very difficult thing because the easy thing to say about improving the situation that we are in now is to, to, to say education. I mean, we need to have more education in, certainly in British schools about Chinese civilization and Chinese history. Um, we need to have more people studying Chinese. We need to make China familiar. Um, but that probably will have a very, un, um, uh, you know, very difficult to assess outcomes. Um, just because you know more about something or somewhere doesn't mean you're going to have an easier attitude towards it. I mean, after all, the British views towards Europe are, you know, kind of very complicated. Uh, and we know more about Europe than we do about China, for sure. Um, people study China, uh, uh, French and German and Italian at schools. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean they're going to have a very friendly view. They may, in fact, end up having a less friendly view. Um, so I don't think that we can just assume that education is going to be the golden kind of medicine. Um, I think, uh, you know, it's going to mean a long period of adjustment. Uh, I don't believe, um, you know, like uh, the, the Fucidities trap, uh, I, I don't really think that that's the issue. Um, because I think this is a unique problem now. It's never happened before that, in effect, you've got two nuclear powers. I mean, America and China are two nuclear powers who will not use the ultimate debt, you know, the ultimate weapon against each other because it will mean, you know, mutual destruction. So this really restrains what they can do with each other. Um, the second problem is that unlike the Soviet Union, uh, obviously China is in some ways a capitalist actor. I mean, it, its sort of economy has strong elements that seem very similar to capitalism and it's integrated into the global finance and supply chain system. And for all the talk about decoupling, uh, this is not very likely to happen because I, I mean the attractiveness of the Chinese domestic market is also going to be a very, very big incentive for companies, wherever they're from, to engage with China. And we saw this with the signing, well, the uh, drafting of an investment agreement between Europe and China at the end of last year. At the same time, obviously, as Europe is increasingly arguing with China about you know, human rights and other issues, it's also agreeing, uh, you know, the framework for an investment agreement. So you've got immediate kind of um, conflict between 
what what your you know what the Europeans want. Um, they want one thing but not the other, but they can't pick them apart. Even though you know they try to sort of say that doing one means you do the other. In fact, it's increasingly difficult. So I think you know when you look at the complexity of the problems, you the most you can say is that I, I don't think the worst outcome is going to happen. Thankfully, I think that it's likely that issues like climate change are going to get more serious and mean that the pressure for China and Europeans and Americans to work together gets greater for self-interest. And that gives a pathway to finding out ways in which we can work together um, for a common good. But I also think that we are going to have to construct this language of disagreement. We just have to say, okay, um, you know, in any um, argument, no one walks away completely winning. No one walks away completely, well, not often completely losing. You know, an argument where someone is just completely defeated is probably not good because they'll be very resentful. <laughs> um, what you want is an exchange. And, you know, there are ways in which partners can talk to each other all the time. We do this all the time as people, as communities, as institutions. We have dialogue, we agree, we disagree, and we reach some kind of midpoint. Now, with China, that's going to be a multi-layered discussion. We are obviously a long way into it, but we've got a long, long way to go. And what we're looking for, I think, is a framework where we can agree to disagree. I think that's the really important thing because I don't think, <clears throat> I mean, the strange thing is that I think we are, I mean, are clear about where we're going to agree. I mean, we're going to agree on climate change. We're going to agree on how to deal with global health issues. We're going to agree on sustainability. I think there's a consensus. So with China, we're dealing with a partner on those issues. And those are the big issues about human survival. But we are going to need to uh, have a way of dealing with our disagreements because while those are significant, they are not important enough to jeopardize human, you know, the, the future of humanity. <laughs> I mean, you know, what could be important? More, what could be more important than that? So I think this is the stage we're in. I think it's going to be a, a very long stage. I don't think this is going to be sorted out uh, very easily. Um, what it means, uh, Henry, is that you and I are in a growing area. We are, we are we're, we're in a growing sector because there's, no, there's going to be no sort of bankruptcies where we're working because I think this is going to be, it's a golden age of diplomacy, a golden age of dialogue, and that's good. But it doesn't mean that the dialogue will be easy. Um, I, I think we have to just accept that. So this is a long phase we're in and we shouldn't try and accelerate things too much. We shouldn't try and fool ourselves that it's going to be easy. We just have to deal with our disagreements step by step. Yeah, thank you, uh, Kerry. I think <clears throat> you're absolutely uh, uh, hit on some of the right uh, challenges that we are facing. I, I, I agree that we really have to have uh, 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 more dialogue, but also um, how we can really uh, deeply understanding of each other is, is a daunting task uh, for, for, uh, for scholars like us, and of course, uh, <laughs> uh, all the China watchers, but also more than that, you know, the, uh, uh, the international community with uh, such a rapidly developing China, rising China, how we can really shape this new understanding narrative and uh, uh, that we, we really uh, as you said, uh, agree to disagree. I mean, uh, at least, uh, you know, let's not uh, fight, but let's talk, let's discuss, and let's uh, 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 really seek the, uh, uh, you know, a common ground, but but also keep the differences. Uh, that That's really, uh, as Chinese say, in I mean, that's absolutely uh, necessary. Uh, so, so talk about uh, the, the, the more uh, uh, geopolitical, but maybe international relation. You, you, you mentioned about the US. Now that, that we have a new uh, uh, US President Biden now is in, 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 
in power now for over a month now. But I noticed that in his first speech, uh, internationally uh, lively broadcasted uh, at Munich Security Conference, uh, where uh, uh, leaders of Atlantic nations that joined at the, about three hours of conference, uh, CCG Secretary General was actually invited to raise a question there. <laughs> but basically, what I see from uh, 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 President Biden said that China will be a, a strategic uh, compet competitor. He didn't use the word uh, rivalry, I mean, like the, uh, President Biden used in the past. He talked about, uh, you know, there's a lot of challenge that the uh, U.S. is going to face with China, but also there's an area like climate change, like uh, uh, things like a pandemic fighting that we can really uh, work together. I'm very glad to see that uh, uh, President Biden actually pledged uh, on the same day at the G7 summit $2 billion to, uh, to support the developing countries in fighting pandemic. Actually, President Xi actually uh, pledged $2 billion uh, <laughs> six months uh, or, or eight months earlier. So, so I see that the, the, the two leaders now uh, are really, uh, they had a long dialogue uh, on the eve of the Chinese New Year for two hours on the telephone call, which is, uh, you know, President Biden, uh, uh, um, you know, wish all the Lunar New Year's to the, to the Chinese Americans, but also when he had the phone with the president, she, to the Chinese people. So, so I think there's, there's some positive uh, uh, elements I, I can see. So. What do you see from uh, uh, now on the, uh, uh, the sign of U.S. relations? I mean, whether the trade will still be a, a hot issue or maybe uh, the uh, uh, U.S. is now seeking more uh, Western alliance. Uh, what I see on the Munich Security Conference uh, uh, broadcasting live where Angela Merkel and President Macron didn't echo uh, President Biden completely, you know. Merkel said China, you know, we have to, uh, you know, deal with China, but China is also a country to collaborate. Uh, uh, whereas President Macron says, of course, uh, 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 EU now uh, strategically probably will be more independent uh, because U.S. now have an Indo-Pacific now. Uh, so what do we think about uh, uh, for the Biden administration uh, the, the next four years that uh, he's in the office? And also, I, I also noticed the recently uh, U.S. General Chamber of Commerce has issued a report that the trade war actually uh, could cost the uh, US 1% uh, GDP and several hundred thousand jobs. So what do you think uh, uh, the US new government would do, you know, economically um, continue uh, Trump's policy or maybe politically uh, or geopolitically or alliance building, even alliance building uh, like ASEAN leaders would not uh, take a side as the uh, uh, Prime, Minister, Prime Minister of Singapore, Li Xianlong just said, you know, you, you don't, uh, we don't want to side with uh, uh, any side on, on, on containing China or, 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 or for that matter. So, so I, I, how can that uh, relation be continued uh, in a more uh, 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 constructively or maybe we can repair somehow the, the Sino-US relations? Yeah, I mean, I think the tone of the new American president compared to the previous one obviously is different and you know, that will help because often the very provocative, uh, aggressive language of, uh, you know, Trump created its own problems. Um, I guess it's often not really kind of uh, uh, thought about, but the second thing is that Trump didn't really delegate properly. I mean, he didn't build a team around him. It was very unstable. It was really all about him and him deciding everything. And so, you know, the fact is that Biden has a very competent team around him. Um, obviously, you've got Blinken as his secretary of state, but you've got, um, you know, kind of other people who are, um, you know, very experienced and capable. And it's, it's, it seems that there's much more of a team ethos. So I think that's, that's probably going to be helpful. Um, I, I guess the third thing is that, Although Europe and America are not going to be um, completely uh, aligned, I think that they're speaking more with each other now about China and actually just, just sort of trying to work out their common points. And that will probably be helpful because I think it's good for America to realize that it cannot really promote a China policy on its own. It's got to have allies 
Um, and I think that means that there'll be more multilateralism and probably some of its more uh, extreme ideas um, in the Trump era will, will disappear. Uh, you know, there'll be more moderation and a bit more kind of nuance. Um, fundamentally, though, the issue for America is, is the most serious because, you know, it's currently the world's biggest economy and China is competing with that. And I think this is a psychologically a huge moment. You know, there'll be a day sometime in the next five to 10 years, probably sooner rather than later, where we'll wake up one morning and China will be the world's biggest economy. And this will be an historic moment. You know, the first time in modern history that an Asian country has been number one. <laughs> um, the first time in modern history when China has been economically number one. The first time in history when a communist country has been number one. I mean, this is a huge moment. And symbolically, it's going to be in incredibly um, difficult for America to know that they are going to be number two economically. Now, of course, in many other areas, they won't be number two militarily. And, you know, in terms of their alliances, they'll be number one. But I think it's going to really have an impact on their view of themselves and how they, you know, kind of their status in the world. And this is going to be a problem. Um, I think America has a sense of self-esteem and, you know, pride. And just because they will no longer economically be in the number one position, I think this is going to then feed a lot of other doubts. Um, you know, for many years, we've had to kind of uh, kind of wonder whether America is a declining power and, and have often said many, many times, no, it's still dominant in many areas, you know, across economics, into technology, into you know, the, the world's biggest companies are mostly American, the world's, you know, kind of military, if you add it up, I think the, uh, you know, top five, they would still not equal America's expenditure, you know, it's, it's still the most powerful country, and it's likely to be so for a long time. But this one kind of indicator, you know, America's um, economic status is going to be symptomatic for many of, you know, a shift it's going to be very tangible, a very powerful moment. And I think this is the kind of thing that is really feeding a lot of the anxiety in America. That actually, it's not just about economic change. It will then mean a whole bunch of other changes because, you know, in effect, America will no longer be the richest country in the world. For sure, per capita, of course, it's totally different. China is still a middle-income country, basically, a moderately prosperous country per capita. But in total, China will be the richest country in the world. So this will mean many, many things. It's an enormously important geopolitical moment. Um, one of the key moments of you know, modern history and probably more significant than the collapse of the you know, kind of uh, Soviet Union, probably more significant than any event since the Second World War. Um, this is going to be an enormous and important event. And it's already starting to have an impact. Already you can see with China's economic growth being greater than that of America out, coming out of the pandemic, every day it's getting closer to that target. And I think when that target is even closer, there will be more political turbulence because I think America is very uneasy about this moment. And when it was looking at Japan being, you know, I think it was about, <laughs> I think Japan was about, sort of two thirds the size of the uh, American economy in the late 1980s, there was already this anxiety, you know, about how do we deal with Japan, you know, and, and that kind of problem went. And I think there's a hope in China, that, a hope in America that the same will happen with China, that there'll be some issue and that China's growth will fall. But at the moment, we don't see that. Um, I mean, the pandemic has had some impact, but the IMF shows that at least this year, China is likely to grow well and is likely to continue to grow well. So unless there is a total disaster, um, then I think that China's on, on this path to being the dominant economy. 
and the political implications of that are very, very profound. Yeah, I think you have really made a very uh, right, accurate analysis of uh, the, the situation that we're going to see in the next five to 10 years. Uh, China uh, uh, is rising uh, uh, rapidly and uh, uh, economically, uh, politically, uh, uh, so that uh, uh, how can really the, the world, particularly the US, accept that? Uh, you know, as you said, you know, they've been in the number one position for hundreds of years, 100 years now, but uh, uh, now we have this uh, 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 new China probably overtaking US as the largest economy uh, in the world. Uh, psychologically, it takes a while probably uh, to adjust. Uh, but also I think that uh, now we're in a very, uh, very challenging world now, you know, with, uh, for example, we're facing this pandemic it really needs China, US, EU, and all the other countries together to fight the common enemy to the humankind. And we have this uh, climate change where uh, President Biden uh, holds very dearly to, to his uh, position you know, to, to, to fight that. And they need China to collaborate. So hopefully you know, we could have this, uh, we could have a more common interest while the world evolves, develops the new challenges, the new risk and the new uh, catastrophe that we really, uh, the human race will unite it. And uh, uh, let's, let's set aside, you know, ideological differences and also uh, some of the, uh, you know, bias on each other, but, but let's work on uh, how we can face in a common uh, enemy and the common threat. So, so I'm thinking that, for example, the, the, the Second World War where US led uh, a new international order, you know, we had a, a Britain Wood moment and that we had a new Britain Wood system. Now we couldn't say we had a third world war, but we really had a pandemic world war. But maybe after that, should we have a new Britain Wood uh, moment where we can enhance and increase some uh, uh, global public goods and the global uh, governance system, like uh, for example, how we can fight future pandemic uh, uh, crisis. And also of course, uh, can we uh, have a climate, world climate organization of some kind? Or can we really uh, uh, upgrade? Uh, because the infrastructure is, is lacking in many other countries now, even in the US uh, is, is, is also uh, 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 crumbling to some extent sometimes. But you know, can we really, for example, upgrade the Asia investment, infrastructure investment bank to a world uh, uh, investment, uh, infra infrastructure investment bank where China and US can work together uh, coupled with the World Bank and all the development banks, and let's probably make a button road that China and U.S. work together to infrastructure uh, 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 revolution to, to modernize the whole world, that we have some common things to work along uh, rather than we fight each other. So, so, so that's really, I think you, 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 you pose a lot of uh, deep thinking questions for us to uh, uh, digest, uh, which, is, uh, which is, I think, very, very necessary. But also, again, on, on Europe, I mean, you mentioned about Europe now, and uh, uh, Europe is really in a unique position. I mean, uh, how do you see EU now, which have now uh, uh, signed this uh, comprehensive uh, uh, agreement on investment with China, uh, uh, which is uh, on the last day of last year, of the last day of uh, Germany's uh, uh, chairship of, uh, of the EU, and uh, we're still going to be ratified by many uh, EU countries, but, but this kind of a, the business, uh, the ties, uh, now China become EU's largest trading partner. Uh, can EU also, as you said, is very important uh, probably allies of, of US. Can you, EU play a, a, some kind of mediation role or maybe let's have a trilateral summit between EU, uh, US and China. And let's really work together and EU can be really uh, not directly confronting with China, but also uh, have a lot of common interest, but it's shared a long history, but also it has a, a good relation with the US and has a good business ties with China. So how do you see this CI, uh, uh, you know, new investment treaty and then the future role of EU uh, with China and with US? Well, I mean, one of the strange things is that uh, in recent years, Really, Europe, uh, China, and America haven't haven't kind of had a formal trilateral dialogue at all. I mean, they never really sit down um, with each other and talk about common issues. I mean, they 
may do it as part of the G20 or other four, but they don't, as three separate entities, sit down and, and talk together. Um, and I mean, part of that is because I think that the Chinese and the Americans are very jealous of their relationship. They don't want others to come in. You know, they're the two great powers. And so they are quite protective. I think the second reason is really because, of course, the European Union um, is now 27 member states and it's, it's different to America and China. I mean, it's not a single sovereign entity. It's, it's you know, kind of a, a consortium. And of course, with the you know, British leaving the European Union, um, which you know, was a very unfortunate thing, but with that happening, um, we now see uh, you know, kind of Europe consolidating again. And um, you know, for a while, it looked like Europe was really threatened as a project. Um, it goes through ups and downs. You know, I mean, it, Europe is perpetually in crisis in a way, but in a sense, you're kind of always having to acknowledge that this consortium is more helpful than it's not. You know, it, it does deal with some issues well. And investment protocols probably are one of those issues. You know, it's a good way of um, negotiating with people because of the size of the European investment and trade market. So, I mean, the kind of uh, ways in which Europe, China, and uh, the, 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 the uh, Europe, China, and America can talk to each other. Um, you know, this would be a very important global gathering. At the moment, um, it's true that Europe and China uh, have their high level dialogue and I think that happens annually I mean it happened I think um, kind of at the end of last year there was you know the kind of uh, annual meeting online and um, the high representative for foreign affairs Ursula von Leyen and then the, the president of the EU um, sorry the president of the EU uh, Ursula von Leyen and then the High Representative for Foreign Affairs um, met uh, Xi Jinping and they had their discussion. Um, and I mean, obviously, China and uh, uh, the US have their, it used to be called, I think, the High Level uh, Economic and Strategic Dialogue. I think it's now called the High Level, um, kind of the high level Communication Dialogue or something. It's changed its name slightly. Um, so that has been meeting. Um, and also the Europeans and the Americans have a dialogue on China. So the one thing that's missing is that they all get together. Now, uh, is that possible? I mean, I think on climate change and on pandemics, of course, it makes a lot of sense. Um, whether they will able, well, they'll be able to find common cause is another matter. I mean, I think for America, it... Um, feels still that it should be in charge of the relationship with China, so it doesn't mind Europe agreeing with it, but it doesn't like it so much when Europe disagrees with it. Um, for China, I think it is aware that, in a sense, it's going to go into a meeting where there's always going to be two against it. <laughs> you know, I mean, China and uh, uh, will be facing America and Europe, where they're they're probably likely on very tough things to sort of, you know outvote it and, and, and kind of, you know, disagree with it. So I don't think that we're quite at the moment where, um, you know, these three will be actually separate, you know, like as, as three sitting down. I think uh, on climate change, though, almost certainly, uh, they are commonly aligned. I mean, Biden has brought, you know, America back into the Paris Convention. Um, Europe is committing lots to decarbonizing its uh, it's in economies and environment. And of course, China has committed to complete decarbonization or not producing any carbon by 2060. And I, I think its targets will become more ambitious. So this is an area of big mutual um, collaboration. And I think, you know, if these three, basically, if you say that uh, America, Europe and China agree on something in this area, then it will have a huge impact especially if you can bring India into it, you know, then you've already covered a vast, vast part of the world uh, in terms of its population and its geography and, of course, its economy. And once you have those, um, you know, kind of in place, then others will maybe follow. Uh, the leadership uh, role for 
the three here is absolutely huge. So I'm hopeful that that's going to be really where you see how proper uh, kind of dialogue and collaboration with China can happen and where it can lead to very beneficial outcomes for everyone. Yeah, thank, <clears throat> thanks, uh, uh, Kerry. I, I, I think that, uh, that you know, the idea actually <laughs> comes out of, you know, for the last uh, two or three years, uh, Center for China Governance, we, we, uh, we, every year we went to, uh, 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 goes to a Munich Security Conference. I mean, we actually proposed at Munich, uh, Munich Security Conference that why can't we have a, a trilateral dialogue of some kind? Because particularly during the last two years, when the China and US have a fierce trade war, and also uh, on the, uh, you know, uh, aircraft uh, on the Taiwan Strait and the uh, uh, South China Sea, you know, every, everywhere is very tense uh, with sanctions uh, on, on a daily basis when, <laughs> when uh, former uh, President Biden and uh, Secretary, uh, uh, you know, uh, Pompeo was, uh, was every day, basically. That, you know, you have that kind of tense moment. If we have, a, you know, if, if two you know, two big guys quarrel, then you need a third party to really uh, intervene or mediate, at least to let them calm down. I, I think that where, uh, where is how is a rise that we thought of that uh, on that. But I see actually, after we mentioned that at Media Security Conference, that EU and the US now set up a, a, a dialogue on China without China participating uh, when Pompeo was, was still there. So, so, so what I'm seeing is that maybe we hope and you're absolutely right. We all those global issues. We really need the uh, U.S., China, EU to work together. Climate change, pandemic fighting is another good example on WHO cooperation. So uh, another uh, suggestion we made is that uh, maybe uh, 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 you know on top of uh, G7 we could add uh, China, India, and Russia uh, for for a climate summit. Mm -hmm. Whereas, uh, you know, over half of, uh, of, of the world population and over 60, 70% of the, uh, uh, big, the six biggest, uh, uh, you know, emitters of the carbon uh, among those 10. So, so somehow we, we have to really re-engineer or re-invigorate uh, the, uh, the, the uh, past pandemic, a new Britain Wood movement that we need to find a new mechanism. Of course, G20 is great too, United Nations, everything is great, but I think we need a little bit more focused on the specialty like that. So, so that's where uh, I, I think that uh, we, we said the, about these uh, 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 you know, new proposals uh, from think tank point of view. But, but, but since you are now in, in UK, you, are, you, you, you live in London, I, I want to bring you another question about uh, this, uh, this uh, brief exit, of course. Uh, you, you've been experiencing that, and then uh, we, we see globalization, deglobalization. Uh, going on, and then finally now uh, you, you separate from EU. But now I notice also that uh, uh, UK is applying for joining CPTPP. So UK still has a lot of uh, influence. I mean, a lot of soft power too. I, I think that uh, either UK joins the CPTPP or maybe uh, working closely with China, like uh, uh, Theresa May said, the global Britain. I mean, if you look beyond EU, uh, at the far east is China. So. Uh, uh, that is so important. So, so what do you think about uh, China-UK uh, relation? Particularly now, we have a lot of uh, uh, seems to have a lot of dispute, uh, 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 many mm. issues like Hong Kong and things like that. Uh, how can we really uh, reconcile that, and then can we really uh, get back to the golden age, if possible? And then, because as you said, you know, uh, UK is still the second largest destination for Chinese students. Over 150, 200,000 students were there. Uh, tourism and, and many other collaboration. Uh, 48 groups, uh, you know, have traditionally worked with China for many years. So, so what, what, what can be done? And what do you think about UK's new role uh, now with uh, collaboration with China and and also uh, in the future? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's been a difficult year because of COVID-19 and because of. I think a, a kind of uh, increasingly uh, sort of political fight. Um, part of the reason for that is I think historically the Conservative Party, when they've been in power, have been um, maybe more confrontational with China. Um, I mean, that seems to be my memory that, you know, when the Conservatives are in, there's usually more fights with China. Um, and you know, they are now the kind of dominant party 
And there is a significant group within the Conservative Party uh, that have created this organization called the China Research Group. And, um, you know, they clearly see China as a very particular kind of problem uh, and are, are keen to kind of, you know, sort of make that the way that we understand China in the UK. Um, and uh, I mean, on the whole, as I've said, historically, the Chinese sort of image in the UK has not been a high profile one. It's, it's been more marginal. Uh, Britain has not kind of paid a huge amount of attention to China. Its main interests have been Europe and America. Um, and so there's a sort of lack of understanding probably of what China is and what China should mean. And now we have a lot of people who do talk about China, but they're talking about it almost all in the kind of framework of COVID-19 and, you know, all of the political issues about where did that come from? How did it happen? And, you know, who's to blame? Um, so this has kind of really made the uh, discussion on China in the UK a little bit distorted. Um, you know, the, the longer term issues have been lost sight of. And a lot of people are talking about China now who never had much of an opinion about it before because it suits their particular political interests. Um, the populist politician Nigel Farage has suddenly started taking note of China. And, you know, he's obviously a nationalistic kind of figure. He was the kind of maybe one of the main influences behind Britain leaving the European Union. And I think that's really unfortunate, you know, once someone with his kind of track record of just creating problems and creating divisions and creating resentments, manipulating, when they kind of become interested in an issue, it, it usually makes the public debate more difficult. Um, despite that, I think that British people are pragmatic. Um, I think that there are gonna be lots of opportunities to find spaces to work. I think that we are more moderate in our approach. Um, we have many people, I think, trying to influence us now. We have, you know, kind of these sort of strange uh, kind of slightly kind of, um, uh, uh, you know, kind of worrying figures like, uh, you know, Clive Hamilton, uh, this Australian um, academic who, who's been kind of making some big claims about how China influences politics in the world, but, you know, these are things that only he seems to be able to see because he can see this hidden hand, but no, no one else can really kind of see it as clearly as him. Well, you know, I, I think this kind of language in the UK does have a bit of influence, but I'm also sure that there are much more moderate voices here who are more thoughtful. And when I talk to politicians, I'm struck by the fact that maybe in public they say one thing, but in private, they are aware of the complexity of what they're looking at and they're trying to find a kind of road in which we can look after our interests, but also acknowledge some of the disagreements. And I think, you know, that's what we're all about. You know, we're all trying to find that kind of middle road. Um, we're all trying to look after our interests, but also trying to acknowledge that, you know, we need to cooperate in certain key areas. Um, and there are other areas where we're not going to be able to see eye to eye. And I think um, politicians have not gone to the extremes, maybe as some in Australia or some in America. You know, there's no very prominent public figure who has so far signed up to this idea of a, you know, kind of huge China threat. You know, I think we are not at that level. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's still being kind of developed, this issue. And I think it's something that we shouldn't be lazy about. So for my work, you know, I'm not kind of here to convert anyone. I just want to have the best possible debate about issues around China, the best understanding of what we think about China and what China, you know, kind of means to the UK. I'm optimistic because in most surveys, uh, it seems that moderates and those who are more pragmatic are uh, outnumber the more extremists. Um, I'm not saying that there aren't things that we shouldn't be concerned about and we shouldn't really focus on, um, but I do think that we need to be pragmatic. And that's something we can learn from the Chinese because I think, you know, in the last few decades, the Chinese have also been pragmatic and it seems to have worked in some areas for China. So I hope that pragmatism can work for us. Great, okay, thank you, uh, <clears throat> uh, Gary, on that. 
So, so my, my, my final question would be, uh, for me would be, you know, now we have a lot of, uh, uh, as we, you know, for the last, uh, uh, you know, uh, an hour and a half discussion we have is that uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, discussion centered on, you know, the gap between uh, uh, China and outside world, how we can minimize that gap. Uh, one of the things I, I, I realized, for example, what has happened in the U.S. where uh, populism is, is, is strong, where President Trump got elected, but also uh, we, we, we noticed that uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the most richest uh, people in the, in the Wall Street, like 1% of that is equal almost to half of the general mass population of the U.S. So the gap is widening the rich and the poor. I mean, China had that issues too, but Chinese government is really mobilized all its can to eliminate the extreme poverty where they uh, just announced that uh, last week that they have achieved that uh, uh, elevating 800, uh, you know, 100 million people in the last uh, uh, eight years of, uh, uh, of, of, of this uh, new objective, 100 million out of that. So totally 800 million. So, so what do you think, you know, because, uh, because domestically they all have that kind of issue I noticed that President Biden wants to raise the minimum wage from $7.8 to $15. Uh, probably wants to address that uh, extreme poverty issue in the US. But, but very often, uh, this kind of issue domestically, uh, China become a, a scapegoat because, uh, uh, for example, all the manufacture was made in China, but doesn't mean China take all the uh, profit. Uh, whereas Chinese export, you know, uh, multinational accounts, the 40, even 50% of that. Uh, Apple phone, uh, uh, you know, that, uh, uh, you know, uh, sells a thousand dollars in the U.S., maybe China made $50 of that. So, so but on the count, on the, uh, uh, you know, CIF or FOB, that export value, China maybe got half of that, which is not necessarily true. So, so what do you think, you know, how we can really address this global governance is falling behind global practice, whereas multinational probably uh, made uh, made a huge uh, 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 gains in the, in the last uh, number of years, uh, last two or three decades, whereas they are probably not benefiting the host country enough uh, and not home country enough. Uh, so that we need the international coordination to have a new, uh, probably kind of a, uh, governance system to really benefiting all the countries, so that we can really uh, not having so strong uh, popular uh, uh, uprisings throughout the world. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I I think um, the the achievements that China has in in poverty reduction and, and alleviation and and elimination should be better appreciated in the outside world. And you know, even I looked on the BBC website when the announcement was made that poverty elimination had happened, and I think there was a recognition that yes, I mean, in the last forty years, uh, how do you define it? you know, a huge number of people have been lifted out of poverty in China. Um, whatever the reasons for that, you know, I mean, it's an achievement. I think we, we need to recognize that. This is, this is why China is not a straightforward story, you know, for all the things that people are very critical about, and maybe should be critical about. There are some things which are huge achievements and they should also be celebrated. And yet it's not easy to Kind of say that sometimes because it's it's like the narrative is always going to be very negative and you don't really get much coverage of those things which are very you know much more positive um i think that uh what strikes me is that the um uh, achievement that china has made is something that we can all learn from and i suppose you know a simple answer to what you just said is we need to have a forum for learning uh, not maybe for dialogue. I think we need a forum for learning. <laughs> and that is a two-way process. And I think one of the final mindsets is it's always been as though, you know, America and Europe was going to China to teach, to show how you do things. And I think now we need to kind of have some recognition that there are many, many things where China can come to the rest of the world and teach and show how you can do. Building high-speed railways has been one very, very huge achievement. Poverty alleviation is another. Uh, there's green technology things that China's doing. There's innovations in other areas of technology. Yes, there are some areas where this is not going to be possible, but there are other areas where I think we've got to learn from each other. And so I think the era of the great learning should start. Uh, and it shouldn't be really just about learning being all one way. 
it should definitely be learning from people who have something to teach and that at the moment includes China who has which has a lot to teach about you know kind of the things that I've just outlined and will continue to have a lot to teach well thank you uh, Gary for your for your really uh, uh, you know, kind of word on that. I, I think China uh, always China has benefited also greatly. I think China alleviating poverty uh, also attribute uh, to you know China joining the globalization. For example, uh, you know since China joined the WTO, China's GDP has gone up 11, 12 times. You know, and uh, and the multinational working in China has also employed the hundreds of thousands of uh, uh, migrants and uh, and the coastal cities and so. So actually, uh, multinational uh, accounts almost forty percent of Chinese exports. So, so I think it's a global effort, but with Chinese uh, really dedicated, constant, with a strong leadership and uh, determination to do that, and also with one five-year plan after another five-year plan. So, so there, you are right. There are some merits there, uh, but how we can you know better tell our story and better accept it outside China is still a challenge. <laughs> Uh, for uh, our think tank scholars. Uh, today, actually, uh, Kerry, you, you've been uh, really uh, kind to of spend so much time. Actually, we actually had some questions. We have, this is live online. We have over, uh, through different portals, we have over 700,000 viewers, uh, listeners on, on our different portals in China and outside China. And we have actually collected some uh, uh, questions from uh, uh, our uh, media. I mean, I just want to maybe give a summary of that and maybe you can give some final answer on that. Uh, for example, we have a question from China, uh, China.org, uh, China Internet Information Center, China Daily, uh, and also uh, we have uh, uh, China Radio International and, and China Rest on News and things like that. So, but I see they have uh, uh, a number of questions, but basically concentrated on these two sections coming up. So do you think this annual reach of uh, 10, 15 days of the National People's Congress and then uh, Chinese Political Consultative Conference is really a, a national exercise for half a month, basically before and after a debate and discussion. And then particularly this year, uh, China gonna summarize what has been achieved in the 13th five years plan uh, people are expecting uh, Premier Li's uh, uh, working report, and also, of course, uh, uh, China going to propose a, a new 14th five years plan. So, what do you think about this 14th five years plan? And also, there's two sections in the Chinese political life, and would, would that be really, uh, you know, uh, have a different uh, uh, system that really uh, also been quite uh, effective in terms of? Uh, uh, coming up one five-year plan, uh, another five-year plan, but also annually, uh, this kind of exercise uh, shows some kind of uh, collective uh, uh, you know, effectiveness. So, so basically, they are questioning a center around 14th five years plan. What do you think about the two sections? And also, uh, uh, actually, one one of the report was mentioned. You have uh, uh, also published a book about China in 2020 and uh, uh, talking about 17 years anniversary of. Uh, uh, People's Republic uh, establishment. So, so you know, I'm, I'm because of time, I'm, <laughs> we are already yeah. a bit over. I'm, I'm collecting all the questions to you. Uh, so maybe you can give your sure. Yeah. Look, I mean, I think last year uh, the delayed National People's Congress and the two meetings. Um, I think it was in May. The main em emphasis was on you know what is China going to do about the uh, kind of alleviating the impact of COVID nineteen, and I think this is going to be the same uh, in interest this year. Uh, I think the world will be very interested to know what China's plans are for, you know, really developing its economy after the enormous hit um, of, of COVID-19. Um, I mean, I think that there's always interest in what are China's plans about, you know, environmental protection. Uh, I mean, unemployment, I think last year there was an announcement about improving, you know, urban unemployment. Uh, and so I think there's going to be kind of a, a lot of focus this year on is there going to be uh, any moves to sort of continue to address issues of underemployment or unemployment? Um, and maybe any innovations that the Chinese government is going to make in dealing with the impact of COVID-19? You know, is there going to be increased health spending? Is there going to be, you know, a, not only attempt to have a green budget, but also a healthy budget? Um, a lot of money in uh, Western countries is going into mental health. Is China going to make similar commitments, you know, about mental health? Um, 
you know, these are things where I think we see an alignment that the common problem of the impact of the pandemic means that the policy issues that China is facing are similar to those of, you know, kind of the rest of the world. And maybe <laughs> there'll be some, you know, kind of clues to how maybe the rest of the world might deal with their problems uh, from looking at what China does. Um, China looks like it's going to deliver positive growth and that is going to be, you know, a great achievement, uh, 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 particularly in the current circumstances. So I think the concentration will be on what measures China is going to make to try to restore and then uh, make its economy, you know, as dynamic as it was before the pandemic. Uh, that's, that is, I think, what are going to really interest people. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Okay, great. Uh, so, so thank you. <laughs> Uh, Kerry, uh, for, for really uh, taking part in the uh, CCG uh, uh, China and World uh, Dialogue Series. I think it's really, uh, we had a very stimulating, very uh, fruitful discussion. I think this kind of uh, exactly uh, symbolizes what you said, that we need more dialogue and uh, among the scholars. So, so I think we, we, we have left ourselves and our viewers enough uh, food for thought. <laughs> it's almost uh, uh, supper time in Beijing. and. Uh, <laughs> We, we, we really hope that we, we got enough information to, 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 to continue our, our, our thinking and, and, and discussion. So, so really uh, appreciate uh, your time and participating in our series. We, we also, uh, we could have another one uh, 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 coming up uh, uh, in the next few two months, but, but I think this kind of uh, exercise are really enjoyable. And also I, I appreciate that, uh, uh, that uh, your, 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 your insights and your, your sharing of your views. And also, uh, we really look forward to your new, uh, 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 you know, coming up new book. And uh, we you. hope that uh, we, we will, uh, you know, uh, have more discussion and uh, trying to really shake some new uh, thinking and new narrative in the future. But really, uh, I want to thank you uh, very much for taking the time. And also I want to thank our uh, viewers, uh, uh, 700, 800,000 of them uh, on, the, on this uh, uh, afternoon, and also our, our media friends who has posed those questions. Uh, so we will stop here, and uh, I want to say goodbye to you, Carrie, and also to our viewers, and I want to uh, thank all of you very much. Uh, we'll thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you. See you again thank soon. You.